Hello, my name is Alex Isles, and the Anglo-Saxons didn't exist. Welcome back. So, some of you are already frothing at the mouth at me just even saying that. And in today's episode, I'm going to be talking about a book by a academic called Susan Osthausen. And Susan Osthausen put forward an argument that the Anglo-Saxons never existed. Now, this was a part of a, a series of books that is published every so often called Past Imperfect. And they are meant to be controversial. They're meant to challenge the academic narrative, to cause people to think, to question things, and basically be, throw a little bit of like um, oil on the fire to get people starting to think more and more about how things are structured. And so her whole argument was that the Anglo-Saxons never existed and, you know, and puts forward quite a convincing argument in some ways. Now, at the end, I'm going to come back to this and talk about some other stuff that's been real, um, revealed since she's published this and my own point of view as well. So we'll discuss that too. But she starts off and she starts off in the late Roman, early medieval period and talks about characters that we know existed and did occur around the sort of the end of Roman Britain. And she talks about St. Patrick, who is obviously the patron saint of Ireland, and Gildas, who probably lived somewhere on the west coast of Britain, um, either from Cumbria down to Wales, and spoke a lot about a lot of the early sort of Welsh kingdoms. And you know, we have this sort of like narrative coming from Gildas about the fall of the British, about um, moral issues, other things like that, that are causing for destruction and damage in his lifetime. Now, she argues that Patrick and Gildas both spoke Latin as their main language. They were educated in the Roman classical style. They wrote in the Roman classical style. They understood the world through a Roman output and Roman culture. And so you have that sort of situation there in the, the 5th century. And when you have this situation in the 5th century, by the time we get to the 7th, 8th century, we start seeing a change in language to Old English. We start seeing a change in material culture towards artifacts that we call Anglo-Saxon. We see a change in maybe building styles as well, though there is a bit of a crossover because in the 5th century we start seeing a different style of housing as well coming in. So there's, there's different things going on. And so she puts forward this whole argument that basically rather than this being caused by migration, when we look at things like uh, the Venerable Bede, who says that basically what happened was that the Angles, Saxons and Jutes, who you can see just over here, migrated into the British Isles and caused for a cultural change to occur, that instead the cultural change occurred within the British Isles. And this cultural change was occurring because there was a huge amount of stuff going on. The Western Roman Empire obviously started breaking apart and the end of Roman Britain is generally seen about 410, 411 AD. When that occurs, we know that Roman Britain continued for a while. We can see from various different writings that there were actually still people living in the Roman fashion, Latin was prevalent, that people still continued to live in that style. But there was a change in the economy and a change in the way things worked. First of all, we see a transformation from massive, huge industrial farms that were required to support the Roman state, the Roman military, and all of the other things as well, to much more smaller family unit holdings, which were to basically to sustain a small population group. So we see an industrial change and an economic change in this period. We don't see mass production anymore, and we see much more regional production and a change in the styles of the types of pottery and other items as well as well as the fact that she also puts forward an argument that many items are being identified as Anglo-Saxon and inspired by Southern Scandinavia were actually probably an evolution of late Roman material developments as well, but it occurred within the British Isles. So that's an interesting argument in itself. When we've got this argument going on, she also puts forward the argument that Bede, who we often know from his ecclesiastical history of the English period, is building a mythology for the Christianization of England and the dominance of Northumbria. So he is wanting to show the Northumbrian dynasty, the Northumbrian power, and the importance of saintly kings like Edwin and Oswald within that Christianization. And so the importance of the Northumbrians, the importance of their monarchs, and also the importance of Christianization is the main argument 
forbid. And so he puts forward this that is a more of a mythological story, in her opinion, than it is an actual historical narrative. And then other dynasties as well started to come alongside this. So for instance, down in Wessex, which is just down here, there were, there's a, a mythological story of two kings, Cedric and Sindric, who basically um, come in and invade with three boatloads and take over the core of what would eventually become Wessex. Now, their names are actually British names. So she says, much like with the sort of what she argues with Bede's historical narrative, is that what's happened is that they've taken these two kings' names and they've put a story of these three boatloads coming in so that they can then bring them back into line with this idea of migration from continental Europe, from the Angles, the Saxons and Jutes, and therefore create a mythology that is more in line with the migration story. Now, with this story coming in, she actually puts forward the argument that English actually didn't evolve from a migration of people, but started as a trade language. And that actually early on, there was a multilingual society. So many people would speak Latin. Alongside this as well, they would speak Brythonic or Old Welsh. And this was sort of the, the language that had come from Iron Age Britain. And then alongside this as well, because of the fact that the Frisians just over here were the main traders in Western or Northwestern Europe at this time. As they came in, people would learn the Frisian language for trade. And so the Frisians would set up emporia or trading sites within Britain. When they set those up, people would then come in and speak. And slowly and steadily, that evolved to become Old English because Frisian and Old English are incredibly similar. And so because of that, the Old English would pick up a little bit of Latin or a little bit of Platonic and then slowly became a language that most people would use in their daily lives alongside their multilingualism with Platonic and Latin. And she says that continued for quite a long time. Alongside this as well, she also puts forward the argument that the east coast of Britain started looking more and more towards Scandinavia rather than towards Rome whereas the west coast of Britain looked more towards Rome. Now this was because of a number of reasons. First of all, she argues that with the collapse of Roman authority, then the east coast of Britain, rather than clinging on to Roman authority, that could be incredibly unpleasant. I've already talked about these massive huge farms and the incredible difference in power and status between those people who would have farmed those farms, who lived pretty much almost as slaves or may have been mass slaves, right the way through to the really powerful villa owners who were hugely wealthy, hugely powerful, and controlled as masses of land within the British Isles. So when you've got this massive difference in power between those who are farming and those who are enjoying the benefits of controlling these huge industrial farms, well, when the whole Roman system falls apart, it doesn't look good if you're descended from those people. If you're descended from the villa owners and suddenly you haven't got the legions, you haven't got the Roman authority, you haven't got the backing of the Roman state, that could lead to some very unpleasant violent revolution. So you start looking towards the new power and this new power in southern Scandinavia with especially stuff like the Vendel culture in southern Sweden and the culture over here with the Germanic peoples and you know the, the Franks over here who have become very powerful in northern Gaul you start becoming a bit more Germanic. You start falling into that sort of like culture. You change your fashion, you change your language. And you say, well, actually, no, no, we're much more like these people. We are we're culturally like these people. We're not anything like the Romans. We're, we're gonna reject Rome and accept this much different style of living. Whereas in Western Britain, which interestingly enough, had a much stronger resistance to Roman rule in many ways, um, starts looking more to Rome for its inheritance, for Rome towards its culture. And even today, you know, and I apologise to Welsh viewers because I'll probably mispronounce this, but uh, the Welsh refer to themselves as Cymru, which is a corruption of the Latin word for citizen. So they actually look towards Rome. They said, we're citizens, we're part of the Roman culture. They look towards Latin, they look towards Roman culture and trade through the Mediterranean, through the Straits of Gibraltar, or what was called in the, um, the antiquity as the Pillars of Hercules, into the Mediterranean, and the trade coming through there has been seen in a number of uh, royal palaces in the, sort of the Irish Sea area. So we can see that there is this still trade connection to Rome, and that would be where they would draw their authority from for their new culture that was coming up. So you'd get this more Germanic on the East Coast and on the West Coast 
a more Roman style, where they would say Britishness is based on Romanness, whereas this new Anglo-Saxon culture is looking more towards the Germanic world for its authority. So you get this new sort of split right there. She then argues that it was actually the Danish invasions in the late 8th, early 9th centuries that then caused for the formation of the English to truly come through. And that actually when we're looking at this Germanic or Scandinavian DNA, it actually, and the isotopes as well, they come from this Danish migration in the 9th century. And so when you start seeing that coming in, and we start seeing the more Scandinavian influence, she then argues that because of people like King Alfred and his dynasty coming together to fight back against Danish invasion, this really solidifies Englishness. That because of that, the dynasty of Wessex, they start looking towards things like Bede, they start looking towards um, Old English, they use all of this to create a cultural force that then can unite various different disparate groups together and create the English. And then from that point onwards, as you have the, the difference between the Danish and the English, that then that creates English overall and then lays the foundations for what become England that we would recognise later on. So that's a really interesting argument for me because what you've got going on there is this creation of an English nation in opposition to the Danish. And when you have that opposition to the Danish, now no longer would maybe a southern Scandinavian style be as attractive for people living in the British Isles to draw authority from. So you create this new authority around Englishness, around this idea of a migration of the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes, a conquest, and then you have legitimacy to create your new English culture, your new English language, which is based from Frisian, and all of those sort of things together to make Englishness. And so she argues for a rapid cultural change caused by sociological factors that then results in the English people. Now, I said at the start I would talk about this, and since she's published a book, New Genetic Research has come through, which I'm sure I'll do another video on, that actually shows that we can definitely prove that there was a migration from the North uh, Germany, from the modern day Netherlands, and also Southern Scandinavia into the British Isles, and there is a genetic impact from that. Alongside this as well, there is another migration that I can talk about more in that video, but it's a really interesting period. We have proof of this genetic migration and of these peoples coming into the British Isles during the migration period, late antiquity, and the early Middle Ages, creating this new group of people who we blanketly call the Anglo-Saxons, but there is some amazing stuff going on during that period. Alongside this as well, future studies have also looked a bit more into the material culture. And yes, a lot of styles and fashions did evolve within Britain, but there was also an influence obviously from the more Germanic world, Southern Scandinavian world as well going on. So Susan Osteisen's argument isn't something that we should just throw out baby with the bathwater, because there are some really important things she mentions about the change in land use, the development of new material culture, and also new fashions within Britain. But alongside that as well, it's meant to be a controversial argument that says, well, you're relying too much on the Venerable Bede and on Gildas to basically argue for this migration. So rather than just focusing on Bede and Gildas, we need to be a little bit more careful about how we study this, how we argue this, and how we bring forwards this sort of understanding of the end of Roman Britain and the start of the early Middle Ages and the creation of what we understand as Anglo-Saxon Britain. So that's why I found it such an interesting book to read, and it's a wee bit jarring because so often we have read stuff, we have learnt about the Anglo-Saxons, and then suddenly you have someone come along and go, no, nope, they never existed, we learnt English through trade and through sharing of ideas, and actually England was formed by the invasion of the Danish in resistance to Scandinavians, and that made England. It's such a jarring idea for us that this can be quite a different one as well. Now I'd love to see what you think down in the comments section. Let's have a really lovely debate, a good chat, and I know some of you might be a little bit jarred by this, a little bit um, uncomfortable about the whole argument, but let's just be polite and civil to one another, and I'd love to see what you think. And from there, then we can just have more of a chat about it. 
If as always, I really hope you've enjoyed the video and if you haven't done already, please do subscribe, share the video with your friends and if you'd like to support me further, I do have a Patreon and a coffee account which you can find in the description below. But as always, there's no pressure whatsoever. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and that you'll join me for another video in the near future. Until then, though, stay safe and well and thank you very much. <laughs>